So we're here at this very large stone, it's just recumbent on the ground here, but um, Mario's just pointed out a couple of uh, cut marks here, which are very similar to the ones we get in Europe, in Scotland, Northern England and other places. Um, so what do you make of this then Mario, what's, uh, what's your take on it? Well apparently both this block and the one that is standing there in the beginning of the corridor, according to the first photographs that we have from the discovery of the monument, they were both standing exactly where they are and they were covered by the mound, so they were invisible. What we believe is that they were both brought to the site to be used on the main chamber, but by some reason they were not necessary and as they were both uh, uh, 15 ton problems that they had to solve, the easiest solution for this one was to drag it away from the monument and cover it with the mound and that one apparently was aligned with the corridor and also covered by the mound so both stones were invisible back when the monument was in use uh, the cup marks uh, usually appear on older contexts uh, usually chalcolithic or bronze age and as we have bronze age burials also on this site the cup marks are probably older uh, younger than the the construction of the monument Okay, so what sort of tonnage are we talking about here? Because it's obviously very large. Well, the piece numbers of rock. I've read uh, place them uh, around 15 tons, but I don't think that no real scientific measurement of the stones has been made. And what sort of rock? Um, granite. Is, this is all granite. Mm. The whole, it's just a granite outcrops. It's all made of local. We rock. are in a in a granitic landscape. Okay. A truly natural megalithic landscape. So we're now just going to check out the main dolmen here. It's huge. It's the tallest dolmen in the world. Uh, part of it, literally in the last couple of weeks, has actually been destroyed. Um, and some of it looks like it's collapsing. So there's some major funding that needs to be put into this site uh, to protect it. And even the road on the way up here was quite surprising. Being the tallest dolmen, one of the most impressive megaliths in the world, it's really just been left to rot and uh, something really needs to be done about this. So is this all the part that's broken yeah. off recently? Yeah. So what, what, was, what, was, what has happened here? Why, is this, why has this been happening? Well, the main reason I would say uh, was the catastrophic excavation that was developed in the 60s. This monument was excavated too early in a period when Portuguese archaeology was extremely amateur and so the main mistake here was the uh, removal of the mound. These monuments can only survive if they are protected by the mound. So by removing it, the archaeologist that has excavated immediately signed his death sentence. We have extreme temperatures in the winter, very cold, and extreme temperatures in the, in the summer. So these monuments cannot endure this kind of treatment for many decades. Uh, but besides that, if you look above us, there is a so-called temporary structure that has been here since 1984. I would say this is probably one of the oldest temporary structures in the world. It's a monument of itself. And even though it was placed here with the good intention of protecting the monument from the rains, it was badly thought and badly designed. And as you can see, in, as you can see it's too short, and so it concentrates the waters of the rains inside the mound. And this is also provoking a huge erosion on the basis of support of the chamber. So the structure that is here to protect the monument is also causing a lot of destruction. I think the only solution that we have here uh, is to stabilize the structure from within, uh, arrange uh, replacements for the, the, the capstones that are missing and cover the whole monument back again with the mound. I don't think a monument like this can survive exposed for, for long. So I'm going to go around the side here because this is the these stones are just incredibly tall. Um, but there's one stone here that seems to be sort of caving inwards that Mario Mario pointed out, uh, and this is actually uh, the gap here, which you can actually see inside the main monument. And you can just see the main chamber here. And just the sheer magnitude of these stones is uh, quite remarkable. 
Um, but this particular stone, we're standing right next to Mario. What is, uh, what's the problem with this? Is it just literally caving in? This one is the, weak, the, the weakest link at this stage. As you know, these monuments are, are almost indestructible if they have the capstone and the mound. Once you remove those two elements, they become extremely fragile and the same thing always happens. One of the stones of the chamber eventually collapses and the rest follow a domino effect. And this is probably going to be the first one to collapse if we don't do anything about it. Okay, and looking at these, I mean, although they're estimated at 15 tons, just to my amateur eye, they look a lot bigger. They look like they're probably 30 to 50 tons, some of these, because uh, granite's heavy, heavy rock. It's very dense. So, um, I mean, some, uh, maybe some other estimates need to be made of yeah. this. Yeah. Are these all the same type of granite, or is there different types here? Uh, once again, no study has been made. I, I, I would like to point out that this is probably the unluckiest monument I know in Portugal because everything went wrong with the story of this monument. It was discovered too early, excavated too early, and as the destruction was very heavy, no modern uh, archaeologist has ever decided to grab this monument and study it because it was heavily destructed. Even the collection, which is the most impressive artifact collection that we have for a dolmen on the peninsula, has not been studied exactly because it was removed with no scientific methodology. So this is a monument that even though it's uh, one of the biggest ones we have in the world, has been abandoned because it was destroyed too early by, by early archaeology. Very, it's so big I can barely fit it in my camera lens. Uh, so this is just the inside of the monument once again. And that's kind of the entrance where a wall has been uh, built up and there's like a smaller monolith just standing there. This is the capstone, it looks like it's fallen down. And these are the great walls of this particular chamber which look probably 30 feet high or something like that. It's, um, it's quite remarkable. So being the tallest um, chamber or dolmen in the world, I mean, how, what's, the, what's the actual height of it? Uh, seven meters. It, it's the height. And the diameter of the chamber is of five and a half meters. It's a pretty big chamber. So is that just the standing stone to that height, or is that when the, the lid was on it, the top was on it as well? No, it's just the height of the slabs we have uh, today. Okay. It's, uh, from the ground to the highest point of the chamber, you have close to seven meters. Remarkable. This is an early stage of the excavation. So what year was this? Uh, the excavation happened between 65 and 69. Okay. So this is the stone we're standing right next to now. This one here. This huge, great granite block. It looks about, what, 25 feet long? Yep. It's strange how they moved it. They moved, they could have left some of the mound there. Yeah. And just, you know, had no. It was entrance. just pure uh, stupidity. Not stupidity, I would say ignorance. Ignorance, yeah, yeah. This is the first exhibition that was made with the collection of Big Domen of Zambjero. Yeah, these are some that are in the Evora, uh, Evora Museum now. Yeah, this is interesting because most of these faces are faces from the old fascist regime. Okay. And so most of them, guys from the church, that were looking just. Uh, astonished, you can see here the face of the Bishop of Evra just looking at these strange prehistoric artifacts. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't turn it into a chapel like uh, the other sites in the area. Oh, uh, you can see here in this is uh, an exhibition that we made about the megalithic landscape, and this is a reconstruction yeah. of the, the dolmen of Zambjer. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll have to go and check that out. We're just way up on the top here. We're seven meters up, looking downwards. That's how tall these stones are. And it just looks like this beautiful and remarkable chamber made out of solid granite. Blocks, I think, weighing a lot more than 15 tons each. It's almost like it's some kind of sacred space. It's certainly a lot of effort, and it was once covered in a mound makes it more significant, the sheer manpower and man hours they have to put into this kind of thing. The main entrance here, which faces out into the landscape the eastern direction towards the equinox. 
and it just goes through and through until you get these huge megalithic blocks seven meters tall mario told me right at the back there making it the tallest dolmen in the world and so the fact that it's just left ruined i find quite remarkable really um when it is one of the possibly one of the most important sites in the whole of europe um, if this was in england or in france this would be a major national monument and there'd anywhere be... in western europe besides portugal yeah. unfortunately even here in spain on the side we have a completely different situation so it's almost like um you know if this was in england if this was in france they have a car park there'd be a visitor center and a cafe t-shirts everything and yet you know it's almost like with the current state of portugal's kind of economy then if they were to kind of just charge people for these things and make them popular it could help because people come to the country because people are, fasc are fascinated with places like stonehenge and Brittany and all these other sites so uh why not I think we have an extremely uneducated class of politicians that hasn't yet been able to realize the economical importance of heritage. So that's why you see no investment in, in heritage, especially in rural heritage. Besides that, uh, the problem uh, today is that most of these monuments remain in private properties and the government does not advance with the expropriation of these monuments because uh, a few decades ago we had a revolution, the 25th of April of 1974, in which there was a massive expropriation uh, by the peasants to the landlords, and that has created a big trauma uh, of expropriation in our country, and still today the politicians refuse to advance to this process unless it's for something that they consider strategic for the economy, to build a highway, to build a dam, to build a bridge. Uh, so once again, because they are unable to realize the economical importance of these monuments, they don't advance with it. Even though, uh, for example, this one is classified as a national monument, so supposedly, even though it's on private property, the Portuguese government has a responsibility over Just it. Behind the monument, we also have this very, very large uh, chunk of granite. Uh, I don't know if you can see the size of that, it's probably 15, 20 feet across. It's all broken up now. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's not too much left of it, unfortunately. Um, do you think this was actually part of the uh, main structure? Uh, this was the capstone that was covering the, the chamber. Uh, apparently, there are contradict uh, contradictory uh, versions. Uh, some guys say that there was a blasting of this capstone with dynamite before the excavation. Uh, and Enrique Lino Pina, the guy that excavated the monument, defends that there was no blasting of the capstone. So it's, uh, it's still a cloudy subject. E anyway, you can see that the, by the, 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 the fracture of the stone that clearly she suffered uh, uh, something harsh. So I, uh, I think that the hypothesis of the blasting is quite possible. Apparently the monument was initially discovered by a group of workers that were searching for granite quarries. So it makes hold the sense that they would have tried to blast it and only after that they realized that they were on top of a dolmen. The enclosures on the Iberian Peninsula, that's one of the rules, they also have an horseshoe shape, an elliptic shape, yeah. oriented it towards the east. They are never constructed on the highest point of a hilltop, but always on the beginning of the way down of the slope. And the axis of symmetry of the monument, if you divide the monument in half, the axis of symmetry is always aligned with the rising of the equinoxes on the landscape. So the, the center of the monument is clearly pointing out towards the equinoxes. So the, you know that when the sun is rising in the center of the landscape, you are getting either close to the spring or close to the fall. And to control the summers and the winters, they also had a very simple but effective strategy, which is to place two isolated standing stones outside of the monument, one uh, on the direction of the summer solstice and another one on the direction of the winter solstice. So all that you had to do throughout the year was to follow the movement of the sun on the horizon. And on the extreme north, you could predict the arrival of summer, on the extreme south, the arrival of winter, and in the middle, spring and fall. So the, the main layer of meaning on the megalithic enclosures seems to be the control and the celebration of the transition of the seasons kind of like a, a primitive but effective calendar okay on the most simple enclosures what they will do is instead of using the isolated standing stones when they have a line of horizon with natural uh, marks they will try to use two hilltops that are uh, 
close to the place where the solstices happen. So they, they will use one of the two techniques. Either they will use the landscape itself. When they cannot, they will use standing stones to mark the, that position in which the sun, uh, the most northern and southern position that the sun reaches throughout the year. I mean, there was the site we visited today, the tallest dolmen in the world. Um, there's problems with that now, isn't there? Like, this, literally in the last two weeks, there's been a collapse. Maybe you could you just tell us um, about why th this has become such a problem at this particular site? Well, this is a very unfortunate story. This monument is now on the verge of collapse, and this is the result of a very long process that began uh, in '64 when the monument was discovered. Uh, it began to be excavated in 65 by a guy called Enrique Linorpina, which was an amateur archaeologist that was working for the fascist regime, and he had a political agenda while excavating the monument. Uh, but besides having a political agenda, he didn't have uh, modern methodologies for, bear, uh, for excavating the monument, and so he committed a number of mistakes and even of brutalities. The biggest of those mistakes is clearly the removal of the mound, the big... Uh, 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 structure that protects the, 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 the megalithic skeleton of the monument. And so by removing the mound, he exposed this uh, seven meter tall um, stone structure to the elements. And after three decades exposed to extreme heat and extreme cold, the monument is now on the verge of collapse. And with the site there, they've also put a tin roof over it. Um, is, there, I mean, is there anything that can be done about this or what do you think should be done about it? Uh, well, what I think should be done about it is to stabilize the structure from within, probably with a metal structure that would uh, sus sustain the whole stone structure, and then you would have to find replacements for the capstones that were blasted, and uh, after replacing the capstones I would suggest that the whole monument would be covered back again with the mound. The mound is the only thing that enables dolmens to survive until our days. Without the mound, they are sentenced to death. And um, is there any way that you could persuade the government or authorities to do we something We have about tried it, it uh, in all the ways that we could. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we finally decided to bring the television to, to, to the monument. Uh, they passed the report on television. It had a huge uh, uh, support on Facebook, but no consequences came out uh, of that interview two weeks later. So we think that... Uh, we are getting into a very desperate situation. We don't know what else we can do anymore. So it's almost like you get sites in England, you get sites in France and Egypt and all these places around the world where thousands of pounds, millions of pounds are thrown at them. They get protected, they get looked after. Um, why isn't this happening in Portugal? Uh, the main reason, I believe, is an extremely uneducated class of politicians which is unable to, real to realize not only the scientific importance or the cultural background, but the economical uh, potential that these monuments have. Uh, can you just explain, um, you know, the construction? Uh, so usually uh, the chamber and the corridor would be the first elements to be lifted up. After these ones were lifted up, the mound was constructed on the surroundings and then the capstones would be rolled up all the way to the top of the chamber and of the corridor. And after that process is completed, the whole structure is uh, covered and you end up basically with what seems very much like an artificial cave. You have only a small rectangular opening in the beginning of the corridor, which is usually blocked with what we call a blocking stone in between burials. So you'd have to remove the blocking stone, crawl, crawl in, do the burial, crawl out again, block the stone. And uh, maybe just to finish off then, you could just uh, let people know about your website, your project, and how people can come and join you on the tours. Well, we have a project of public archaeology called Ebra Megalithica. We make guided tours to the megalithic monuments. Uh, our website is www.ebramegalithica.com. Uh, and uh, please visit our website and get in touch with us. Mm -hmm.